a person. Two or three times a day, that person was his bodyguard. He uh, became uh, so conscious of trying to ring everybody up to find their points of view that uh, by the time he'd gone round and round the subject, he had forgotten what the uh, his real original viewpoint had been. And often it was the last person who, whom he rang who decided the issue. You never knew who was going to be the last person. Morale went from bad to worse. McMahon's old enemy, John McEwen, had retired, but McMahon fell out with a new country party leader, Doug Anthony, when he decided to revalue the dollar without consulting him. To be told that that's what we're going to do was no way to treat a coalition partner, least of all me. I mean, I, I don't like being taken for granted, and I can be as compromising and as understanding as anybody. But McMahon, for some silly reason, took this attitude with me that he was the Prime Minister and this is what had to be done. Then, in a body blow to McMahon, Frank Packer sold the Sydney Daily Telegraph to Rupert Murdoch, then a Labor supporter. When Frank sold the Telegraph, he asked us up to his house, which is just up the road. Um, when Rupert Murdoch was there um, and they were actually signing the deal. Frank made Bill and Rupert shake hands and Rupert uh, guaranteed that he would correct any statements and etc that were incorrect and um, he gave a couple of guarantees which of course never happened. Um, yes, Bill knew that that was disaster as far as the election was concerned. Do you, when you pray, do you pray for things in fact? Yes, I do. Would you pray for something like victory in an election? Yes. <laughs> well, I, I'd sort of lost favour with, with Bill McMahon because Bill Sneddon and I decided we ought to have an election on the budget in 1972 rather than an election with the competing forces of McMahon and Whitlam. When we explained this to Bill McMahon, he was absolutely horrified to think that we thought he couldn't beat Whitlam. And he didn't want to talk to me after that, I really wasn't a friend if I thought so little of him. So when I went to ask him about when we were going to have the election, he just said categorically to me, I'm not going to tell you. And I was a bit taken back. And he went on to say that only three people know about it. And I'm not going to tell you who they are. And I thought, well, this is petty and no use talking to the man anymore. So I walked out. But I thought, now, who could those three people be? Obviously, one would be Sonia, his wife, and he had a young daughter, so I gave her the credit of being number two. But who would the third person be? And I thought, it'll be Jack Marshall, the Prime Minister of New Zealand. There was a custom back in those days for the two coalition parties to try to have elections on the same day. So I rang Jack Marshall up, who was a good friend of mine, and I said, Jack, when are you having your election? He said, oh, Doug, the same day as you're having yours. I said, when are you having yours, Jack? He said, the same day as yours, on the, on the 18th of December or whatever it was. I said, thanks, Jack. So from that point of view, I organised my campaign with either, without having to worry McMahon anymore. Ladies and gentlemen, to present his policy speech for the forthcoming federal election, here is the Right Honourable William McMahon, Prime Minister of Australia. Good evening. Tonight, as Prime Minister and leader of the Liberal Party, I want to talk to you about the issues on which we will fight this election. Basically, it is an election about policies. Policies that will directly affect you and your families for many, many years to come. And they will be years of changing values and expanding opportunities, especially for the young. Uh, it was a hopeless uh, campaign. Uh, there was no uh, display of robust philosophic endeavour. 
or conv conviction. Now, you can't get this from the members of a political party. The leader must be able to portray it. Cabinet weren't supporting him. And um, so, it, you know, he was fighting a one-man battle at the end of the election. Well, most of the election. Perhaps the final blow was when the Sydney Telegraph and its new owner, Rupert Murdoch, advocated a vote for Labor. The ABC's Canberra News Editor, Jack Commons, says the government has been defeated. Party officials of the Liberal Party and the ALP conceded this a few minutes ago. The Labor Party won an 11-seat majority. The remarkable thing about the 72 election was not that the Labor Party won, everybody expected them to. The remarkable thing was that, that uh, McMahon, leading a broken government, came so close to survival. Sir Robert Menzies had kept the Liberals in power for 17 years. Just six years after his retirement, even he was losing the faith. I was surprised one day when he said to me, and I think it must have been after the 1972 election, that he had not voted for the Liberal Party in the last two elections. I was amazed. And so, with some diffidence, I said, well, what did you do? Did you vote informal? No. Well, who did you vote for? He said, I voted DLP. From its record majority in 1966, the Liberal Party had decayed with alarming speed. William McMahon went back to Canberra to tender his resignation. And Liberal ministers began to clean out their offices. <laughs> Nobody knew what to do. I mean, uh, you'll laugh at this. Um, there were five ministers who had to go and buy a motor car. I didn't even have a motor car in the family. There were ex-ministers uh, who didn't know how to dial a telephone. The gods had been uh, thrown out of heaven. And there they were. Uh, no longer with uh, walking behind the big chief, you know, with the uh, sunshades over them and uh, some little boy at the end of the session with a switch keeping the blowflies off their backside, uh, it all disappeared. Uh, nobody wanted to talk to them, they were totally unimportant and they couldn't cope. <laughs> Well, thanks a lot. Uh, it's been a good night so far. You must be careful not to become defensive. Not to become too explanatory. You know, nobody's made any mistakes. They haven't fluffed their lines. They haven't got things the wrong way around. I confidently believe that we of the Liberal Party are going on uh, to greater strength in the years ahead. And, and this, you can get into trouble doing this. Um, uh, I'm not talking about myself. <laughs> we should now look at all our problems in an attitude of generosity of mind and should not have bitterness or recriminations coming into our future actions. Gracie Fields was much, sang in much the same way and she had a song which said, Wish me luck as you kiss me goodbye. Well, that's not my theme song. I'm not saying goodbye. I'm not uh, say goodnight but not goodbye, but wish me luck. Excessive leadership difficulties, the danger of the party falling apart. And I began to think that I could do better than this. Malcolm Fraser dominated Liberal politics for a decade through the force of his personality. His coming to power set off divisions which would shadow his achievements. Fraser won three elections, but by the mid 80s had been disowned by the Liberal establishment. 
I therefore take total responsibility for the defeat of the government. Only now is he being reassessed. 